high feelings on both sides. There was shooting on the in the water uh, between non-Indian fishermen and Indian fishermen. Uh, I thought then, I think now, that's a, that's a strained interpretation. The Indians were clearly the gainers. They were triumphant. The language of the Stevens Treaty, signed between the United States and Northwest Indian tribes over 150 years ago, has been debated time and time again. 27 words are at the heart of the controversy. The right of taking fish at all usual and accustomed grounds and stations is further secured to said Indians in common with all citizens of the territory. What was promised? Towards the mid-19th century, settlers propelled by Manifest Destiny began to establish themselves in western Washington, which was then home to thousands of Indians. The people from the weren't native to the Northwest had never seen anything like the the bounty of fish in all of the major rivers. The fish were staple to them. They were the mainstay of the diet. And they were largely river fishermen, although not entirely. They fished in the marine waters as well, I mean, the native people. When Washington was annexed as a territory in 1853, Governor Stevens began treaty negotiations in accordance with the Indian Treaty Act. From 1854 to 1856, Six treaties were conducted in the inadequate Chinook jargon through which 17,000 Indians relinquished claim to more than 100,000 square miles of land with the promise of cash payments, reservations, and guaranteed fishing rights. For many years, enforcement of these rights was a non-issue as settlers focused on farming, logging, and mining while the Indians continued to trade their catch. The situation changed with the advent of the canning industry in the 1880s when the commercial potential of anadromous fish, those that migrate, went up and runs were harvested recklessly. In addition, dams, deforestation, and industrialization created more pressure on the environment, resulting in the decline of the fish runs. Washington was admitted into the Union in 1889, and without much scientific data, the state began to regulate fishing by instituting closed seasons. When net fishing at river mouths was banned for conservation in 1897, Indians felt that they had lost their right to fish at usual and accustomed grounds. As commercial fishing exploded and salmon was caught by millions, revenue from license fees also increased. In addition, the Department of Game was created in 1933 by steelhead sports fishermen intensifying competition and conflict. In an effort to spread the catch and conserve the resource, the state passed Initiative 77 in 1934, prohibiting the use of fixed nets, traps, and the ownership of fishing stations, which were traditional methods of Indian fishing. Outraged Indians challenged their rights in state courts, where rulings reaffirmed treaty rights but also approved of the state's regulation. Federal policy was equally ambiguous, leaving the Indians no option but to continue exercising their rights. The conflicts increased when each side started blaming the other for the dwindling runs, fearing for their livelihoods. The Indians believed that overfishing in the Puget Sound left them none upriver, while non-Indians felt Indian River fishermen not abiding by state conservation laws left hardly enough fish to spawn. Inspired by the Black Civil Rights Movement, Individuals like Robert Satyakam, Billy Frank Jr., and Hank Adams formed the survival of the American Indians Association and staged fish-in protests, thereby defying state laws but exercising their treaty rights. As the confrontations got worse in the 1960s, celebrities and other civil rights organizations got involved. Well, uh, we, we don't plan only to fish. We also plan some legal maneuvers uh, to carry the issues in certain courts and as hi high as we can go. We, we think that there are evolving some issues of international import relating to Indian tribes of various American nations. The increased public attention and the Bureau of Indian Affairs convinced the United States on behalf of itself and seven tribes to file a case against the state of Washington in September 1970, U.S. v. Washington. 
The heart of the case was the meaning of the phrase in common with all citizens and the rights guaranteed. Uh, my, you know, my view and the state of Washington's view uh, at the time uh, was that that meant that Indians would be treated exactly the same way that set citizen settlers would be treated. This was, this was clearly what the Indians understood, that it was to be shared fishing. The Indian position was no state regulation whatsoever. After three and a half years of pre-trial preparation and three weeks of trial and deliberation, George H. Bolt, the senior judge of the Federal District Court in Tacoma, made his decision. By dictionary definition, and as intended and used in the Indian treaties and in this decision, in common with means sharing equally the opportunity to take fish at usual and accustomed grounds and stations. Therefore, non-treaty fishermen shall have the opportunity to take up to 50% of the harvestable number of fish that may be taken by all fishermen at usual and accustomed grounds and stations, and treaty right fishermen shall have the opportunity to take up to the same percentage of harvestable fish as stated above. Judge Bolt's interpretation quantified treaty fishing rights and outlined state and tribal co-management of off-reservation fisheries. This sent shockwaves through the state. For the Indians, the ruling was a total victory. However, sport and commercial fishermen resented it and wanted to modify the decision legally. I never believed that we could have regulations as bad as they are today. I never would have believed it. This started a new wave of controversies in the media, courts, state capital, and waters. For the next few years, the state refused to implement Bolt's framework and the violence forced the intervention of U.S. Marshals. On July 2, 1979, the Supreme Court upheld Bolt's decision 6-3 and non-Indian fishermen were forced to accept the ruling. In order to guarantee the Indians 50% catch upstream, non-Indian fishing further out in the Puget Sound had to be limited. There were simply too many boats for the fish, and so many commercial fishermen had to go out of business. The federal buyback program was instituted as a way to ease their pains, but feelings still ran high. The new framework required radical changes to the fisheries management system. As Dr. Dick Whitney said, there was a need to manage the harvest on a stream-by-stream tributary by tributary basis in order to accomplish the allocation to the individual tribes and to accomplish the maximum potential yield in the fishery. Both the tribes and the state hired more biologists, environmentalists, and analysts. The tribes took steps to see that the decision was implemented and formed the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission. Cooperation between treaty tribes and the state developed slowly managing everything from pre-season fish forecasts and seasonal catch limits to hatchery releases and cooperative restoration projects. This successful co-management has also been implemented in various shellfish, timber, and wildlife agreements. For the Indians, their victory restored pride and made fishing a profitable business once again, drawing many back to the reservations. We put money into all of our programs, our natural resource programs, our health programs, our educational programs, our enforcement, all of those things. So to me, it is a big improvement. Their newfound voice gave rise to broad-based tribal sovereignty movements and its impact was felt across the world. The tribes of the Great Lakes, Northeastern United States, Canada First Nations, and New Zealand and Australia gained access to their fisheries through re-examinations of treaties. Today, the state's obligation to protect fish habitats is in front of the judge of U.S. v. Washington Phase 2. Differing interpretations of treaty fishing rights led to complex litigations throughout the 20th century, culminating in Judge Bolt's landmark decision in 1974. Even though the state immediately witnessed more violence, the ruling eventually created acceptance, understanding, and cooperation between the tribal and state governments resulting in an effective co-management of the fisheries. This debate forever changed fishing in Washington, and the consequential ruling still remains as the law of the land.